Met metadata has been a, a very important subject for the geospatial community. One of the first standards um, ratified uh, in 2003 was the, the metadata standard, and it was revised um, not too many years ago as uh, the new uh, fundamental uh, model. And Geoscience Australia has got some active experience with um, the implementation of this. So it's with great pleasure to have somebody to, to talk a little bit about some of the activity with that with Metadata uh, from Geoscience Australia. Please uh, welcome Maggie Smith. Thank you. Thank you. So in an attempt to stick to the time limit, I'm going to read mostly. Otherwise, I've got a tendency to sort of go off down rabbit warrens. Um, so as you heard, my name is Maggie Smith. What you didn't hear was what I sent to Richard this morning, um, is that I was a teacher in high school mathematics for 22 years and I've been nine years in the public service. Um, I was, my first job in the public service was on the, off the back of a course I was doing at university because I was teaching statistics using ArcGIS in the school. Went to uni to learn a little bit more about it and the lecturer there said, oh, have I got a job for you? Have you heard of metadata? And I went, no, that sounds interesting. <laughs> and uh, that's where it all started. So I am back at Geoscience Australia. I've, um, in the last nine years, I've been through seven different government agencies, just through changes of jobs and things. Um, so I've sort of come back to the beginning again. I'm working in science data governance and policy, so I'm not in a technical role. And I'm located within a science data section around 14 people who've got responsibility for things like the data catalogue, web services, databases, and GA's interactions with high performance computing. So I'm not an IT professional, but I'm right in the middle of them. So just quickly, there's Geoscience Australia. Came into being in 2001. Uh, two agencies of surveying and land merged with geological. Uh, both of those started in the mid-1940s. So we're basically responsible for geoscience requirements for Australian government for onshore and offshore, and includes things from surveying through to natural hazards and community resilience. So it's a bit of a cross-section. Lots of different science undertaken. Um, we've got a minerals collection in the building, um, and we sort of see different data sets, mapping, bathymetry. Oh, we also do an open day, which is a lot of fun every year. And that's where the dinosaur comes in. Kids love it. It's a seven foot dinosaur. So this presentation, I'm briefly going to cover off on why we use a standard in our catalogue, our actual catalogue, provenance for the data, keywords main as maintained vocabs, and making our metadata available to other government agencies and domains. So why do we even care? Well, as you heard from Brian, that's one reason why we care, because we have a policy and it says that we're going to make our data open. So generally, in answer to the research question about the research data, the data that Geoscience Australia collects is um, CC by, by default, unless there's a commercial and confidence embargo on it. So um, our data catalogue, which was in place before this current open data policy, is a great tool for discovering our data products, but not as good at discovering the data and services that the data product was derived from, which is where this portion of the talk comes in. So why do we use the standard? Just quickly for those I was aware that this was going to be a, a mixed audience, so I've thrown in a couple of extra slides. We use it because of the standardised descriptions which enable online search engines to process queries more efficiently. Um, what's the profile? Uh, Basically, you take the standard, you ignore those optional elements that don't apply or you don't want to apply, you increase obligations of any optional elements as you need to, and you extend elements of the standard as required. Normally, this profile would then be registered with ISO. Now, we haven't got there yet. We're doing a profile of the 19115-1, which is a 2014 version. 
Um, it was given to me on Friday as a document to edit this week. So um, a little light reading now that I've stopped playing around with this presentation. Uh, this might not come up very well, but that's our eCAT, or our electronic catalogue. Uh, we've got diverse physical and digital data and information holdings. Uh, and Geoscience Australia itself contributes to the development of standards and policy in many aspects of geology, geophysics and spatial information. So this is a new implementation. It's based off um, some open source software called GeoNetwork. Uh, it's got about 20,000 public facing records which represent uh, portals, web services and PDFs. But hopefully soon we start to have raw data and software. So metadata records in this catalogue have been migrated from a previous implementation and a previous standard. So it was just the 2006 uh, standard, metadata standard. And as we've migrated across, we've tried to make sure that all records have a persistent identifier, a clear data reuse licence, information on how to get to the data or product, generally via um, a link through the actual metadata record, and in future, records for the data will be linked to the services and portals that use them and vice versa. So the data products are generally well described and we've got a really good workflow around publishing that side of our business. Um, but previously the naming conventions and keywords have all been free text and up to the uh, scientist that has been completing the record. So we're currently working with science areas to create controlled vocabularies for future keywords um, for use in the catalogue. So geology was the first one we started with, so we had three um, discrete lists within the building plus the international ones, so we've been harmonising that and publishing it as a vocab, which we'll be ingesting into the catalogue for the record creation. Um, we are attempting to publish all the things that we're creating. Um, this is a work in progress and it's very new for the team that I'm in. They're not used to putting their stuff out there for the public to look at. They're not used to having their stuff questioned, if you like. So I would appreciate feedback. So if you go and have a look at the site, yes, some things are not going to resolve at the moment, but we're gradually filling in the gaps. Um, yeah. And I'm assuming this presentation will be made available. Yeah, so the link will be there. Uh, this is an example of the um, vocabs page. So you can see that we've also uh, using vocabs as code lists, and we're trying to work out how to pull those into our catalogue. Um, you can see the groundwater one there. And obviously if it's crossed out, it's not available yet. And the profile will be there. So <laughs> I should also say that the work on the vocabs began because um, one of the developers came up to me and said, free text is bad, fix it. So um, <laughs> that, was, that was sort of my starting point with the geologists. Um, symbology for um, emergency services is next. Apparently that's only been going for about 12 years, so it'll be fine. Uh, just to give a specific example about why I'm interested uh, in provenance from a governance point of view. So at the moment we've got advice that's been generated that will be available in our, in our um, catalogue. So the advice might be, I don't know, uh, some sort of hazard advice for a specific region of Australia. So it's generated on a data set that might be seismic, so it might be generated on the totality of the data set at that time, because obviously seismic is, as you know, <laughs> yeah, just keeps on going. Um, the scientists will generate a model using algorithms and provided the advice based on the output of the model. So the advice, assuming it was in, of general nature, is then made available generally as a PDF document. So hopefully the metadata for that advice gives the name of the data set that was used, the area the advice covers, the organisation as author, and perhaps some of the methodology used in generation of the report. So in most cases you could link the advice to the name of the data set that was used to generate the advice, but not easily to the scientist and the models that were used. I'm told that a provenance model of data of a data product could equally work well as a highly structured W3C prov system if you have the elements described correctly. 
And the reason is that my manager until recently is a data scientist doing one of his PhDs in PROV, which is Nick Carr. And that his work is the reason that we've approached this provenance chain issue on my side in this manner. Uh, for those of you like myself who don't know uh, a lot about PROV, W3C, there's plenty on the web. Or I'll give you Nick's email, he'll tell you all about it. Uh, so here's the previous scenario I just described, and it's sort of where we're headed, GA. This is currently happening through lineage and association with digital objects rather than a true provenance model of digital objects. So at the moment, the lineage, it's, uh, in the lineage, you've got a whole lot of free text, and generally the information is in there for most data sets, but it's a bit tricky to try and pull it out in a machine way, machine readable way. Um, so for our catalogue-like things, we need to gradually add the ability to link entities, agents, activities, etc., to be able to use graph-structured provenance across multiple types of objects and across multiple systems in the future. That is Nick's words, not mine. In my role, I'm particularly interested in the repeatability of advice given by any government entity. And as per our Archives Act, advice of this type given by government must be stored for a period of years and include the models, algorithms, software and data that was used to generate that specific bit of advice. So it's a safety net for the entity and for the public servants that generate, or the scientists in this case, that generated the advice. It's currently a very manual process and heavily reliant on the individual ge generating the advice and storing it appropriately. So from my point of view, you want to make governance and policy easy. As soon as it's hard, it won't happen, or it won't happen consistently. So long story long, we extended the standard to include elements that will align with a future PROV model. We're trialling the use of the element was derived from, in our metadata records, from data to product. Um, having all these links embedded, we hope that this will allow a machine readable uh, PROV record to link a metadata record to indicate provenance, which would be an indicator of quality for me. Which is a way of saying that if someone's got a data PROV data product record and it's got provenance in there, I know that the person that puts the data together or the product together uh, has a good grasp of what um, all the pieces that made up that product were. So in our records, if you pull one up um, in our public catalogue, at the top of the record you've got your, obviously your title and your lineage or your abstract and then we generally put in all of the associated resources. So at the moment we've got their portals, um, services, guides, all those sorts of things. Um, and once we start doing provenance chains, we're trying to work out exactly how we'll portray it, but that will be at the top as well. What this looks like for the data manager or the scientist, not great. Um, we put together where someone said we killed the old catalog um, because it was on some software that was failing and we moved to uh, this GEO network which comes with a customizable interface. It hasn't been a high priority at the moment. So trying to get the records into it has been more of a priority. Um, so a bit more of my work is around the data management and uh, helping people put together their records. Um, and that's just an example of where the association type is put, so it was generated by will end up. So there will be a lot of guidance to be required telling people how to use it properly. Because we are in the future moving away from having a physical gatekeeper on our catalogue and people will be publishing uh, directly. Uh, just near the end. Our catalogue's already harvested by other entities, such as data.gov.au, um, which is there, and also our uh, National Archives, the Research Data Community also. We recently sent a DCAT version of the catalogue to our National Archives as a way of fulfilling our obligation under the Ar Australian Archives Act uh, that we have to retain all metadata records forever, it's permanently. Uh, they were very happy to take the metadata. They weren't so keen on taking a petabytes of um, digital imagery from the National Collection, so we still have to hang on to that. 
Another body of our work for the catalogue is in, ta in tagging our data against the Records Disposal Authority so that instead of relying on the scientists to say how long something has to be kept for, we can just put a code against the data or the data um, product so that we can do a sort of a, a weekly look at what records stay and what records go. And this is separate to looking at the usage of data, which is another thing that we do. Uh, so, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>